Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining in with IEEE Region 10 uh, webinar series, Art and Talk. This is our fifth webinar, and I'm really honored to be the host of this session today. The topic of today's session is um, professional ethics and getting ahead. As engineers, ethics is an important topic for everyone in every level and in any domain. Engineers impact the lives of hundreds of thousands of people and are trusted of things that we do and we design. As such, we set a, a standard for professional behavior and that's why um, ethics comes in uh, an important topic for our profession. To talk about this more, we have a very knowledgeable speaker with us to talk more in detail about the strategies to maintain ethical behavior in particular in the engineering field. Before we introduce our speaker today, I would like to announce some ground rules and protocols. Um, all our attendees are muted upon entry. Um, you're not allowed to uh, unmute yourself. This is done to avoid background noise and echo. Um, you are most welcome to introduce yourself, uh, send your comments and questions uh, using our chat uh, feature or the Q&A box. Um, we will be having a special Q&A session right after the talk, so we'll try our level best to address all your questions today. Um, please make sure this webinar is being recorded and streamed live via the Region 10 uh, Facebook page. Without further ado, I would like to now move on to our welcoming address. Uh, to deliver the welcoming address, we have a very special guest with us today. Associate Professor Muhammad Faisal Ahmed Fauzi. Dr. Faisal is a senior member of IEEE, which he first joined back in 2000. He is currently serving as the chair for IEEE Region 10 Newsletter Committee. He also serves as the advisor for IEEE Malaysia section and IEEE Signal Processing Malaysia chapter, both of which he chaired previously. Thank you, Dr. Faisal. It is indeed a honor to have you with us today. Over to you. Uh, hi, thank you, uh, Shabi. Uh, so, on behalf of um, uh, Region 10, okay, I would like to welcome <coughs> all um, uh, members okay, to this uh, uh, series. Uh, I would like to start with a bit of an overview of this uh, Region 10 talk. Okay. This is a new initiative under Icebreak Year Region 10. Okay. It is uh, collaboratively organized between uh, several uh, Region 10 portfolios, okay, namely the Region 10 Industrial Relations uh, Committee, uh, Region 10 Professional Activities Committee, Region 10 Young Professionals Committee, Region 10 Women in Engineering Committee, and Region 10 Student Activities Committee. Okay. The theme or the tagline okay, uh, of this uh, talk is uh, In Pursuit of Excellence. Okay. The objective is uh, to enhance the awareness of trending topics to the IEEE community and achieving excellence through gaining and sharing uh, sharing of knowledge. Okay. Uh, this is the fifth uh, talks in this series. Okay. So far, we have had uh, four talks organized uh, previously. Uh, for those who have uh, attended any of the talks, then probably you are already aware of this. But previously, we have uh, the first talk on innovation and funding okay, de delivered by Mr. Murali Wukapatnam, okay, founder and chairperson of Voxki Technologies. And then we have two talks on uh, opportunities and challenges of integration of renewable energy in grid. Okay. Uh, one of the talks were delivered by Professor Connelly Keith Kickert, okay. uh, <clears throat> adjunct uh, associate prof at the University of Adelaide and uh, James Cook University, Australia. The second of this talk was uh, delivered by engineer Tahir Salim Sheh, okay, who is a CEO of United Engineering Services in Karachi, uh, Pakistan. And then the third uh, talks of this series are on the risk and opportunities. Okay. Um, delivered by Prof. Chandima Gomez, a professor of high voltage engineering okay, and a chair for the ESCOM Power Plant Engineering Institute um, and director of Center of Excellence on High Voltage Engineering, University of Witwatersrand, South Africa. And the latest one we had is on the quantum encryption overview use cases and adoption okay, which was delivered by Ms. Sarif, Saritha and Oti, okay, uh, cyber security practitioners. Okay. 
And as you can see from the you know, the list of the, the, the topics we mentioned just now, okay, the, the topics are quite diverse. Okay? It has a technical element, it has a, a professional elements. And today, okay, we are going to have another uh, talk Okay, as uh, Savi mentioned just now, today's talk is on professional ethics and getting ahead. So you can see from this talk, you can see it from the diverse topics. Okay, uh, we hope. Okay, and uh, I'm very, I'm very sure that uh, that all this uh, talk is very beneficial to the ASPE uh, members. Okay. And uh, coming back to today's talk, okay, um, I think it goes without saying that you know ethics is very important uh, for engineers. Okay, and also for us. Uh, uh, electrical and electronic engineers. In fact, for IEEE, <coughs> excuse me, okay, they have their own ethics and uh, member conduct committee. Okay, so to stress the importance of this uh, ethics okay, among the professionals. In fact, if you notice, they have this uh, award for distinguished ethical practice. Okay, and if you are, <coughs> and probably I can just mention here, the deadline is still. Uh, <coughs> Uh, for this year, the deadline is 1st July, so you still have time to, to submit this. And they also have the IEEE Student Ethics Competition. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so you can see from here, no, IEEE itself you know, is really uh, <coughs> stressing on this uh, ethics. Okay? And we are very lucky to have our uh, speakers here today, Mr. Terence Tan. Yeah, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Terence Tan uh, for agreeing to give a, uh, a talk today. And also, I would like to welcome all members uh, for today's talk. Let me just read a bit of a biography for our speakers today. Okay. Mr. Terence Tan is the program coordinator for computing programs at Curtin University, Malaysia. He has a MEng in computing from Imperial College London and MSc in business economics from uh, City University, London. He analyzes situations from both a technical and management perspective. This has helped him gain Curtin's Excellent in Teaching Award for the Early Career category. He teaches ethics and professionalism for engineers and computer-related fields. He co-developed the game used in the teaching engineering ethics using Blocks game, a research paper. Thus, his knowledge and experience is valuable, I would say very valuable to engineers from early careers and beyond with respect to ethics and professionalism. I'm very sure we are going to I uh, learned a lot here from Mr. Terence Tan. So without further ado, okay, I would like to uh, pass the floor to Mr. Terence okay, to proceed with his uh, talk. Okay, welcome, Terence. All right, thank you. Thank so you. just give me a moment while I go and uh, try to share my screen. Okay, so... All right, so just to make sure uh, you can hear me and you can see my slides. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, we can see the slides. Go ahead. Fantastic. Okay, then. So, um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you again for joining in uh, today. And I just want to share a bit about that game that uh, uh, Professor Faisal just now mentioned. Um, that game was, uh, I, I found it very fun uh, organizing it because what, what, you, what we do is that we get uh, students uh, to come and uh, get into groups and we tell them that it's a competition. We don't tell them it's an ethics game. We tell them it's a competition to see who will deliver the project. So we're going to give them a problem. So in their minds, right, they're thinking that it's going to be a team building games. And uh, by final year uh, or third year, students have already done so many team building games in your first year in various camps, retreats, and so on, that they thought that this was one of those team building games and we focus so much i think there was a little prize at the end we told them that uh, um, that uh, it's important and during the game briefing itself we said okay if you solve this problem as a team uh, it shows your competency it shows that your ability as an engineer so we put the goals really really high what they don't realize is that we have a different agenda <laughs> so they thought it was a technical slash project management actually what we are interested in is the ethical component actually so halfway through the game, we will tell them something along the lines that, um, so everybody has a different role, you see. So you have a project manager, you have the uh, engineer uh, leader, the engineering lead, and they are getting different roles. And we throw a spanner into their works and say that there's something wrong and we may actually need to pull back, potentially even withdraw. 
And then you have the whole team now they're arguing because why are we pulling back? We can actually win this thing. <laughs> so you can see that they are now arguing among themselves, saying that uh, uh, this is a small matter. Uh, it can be easily solved or just dismiss it. Uh, nobody will figure it out anyway. So you have this uh, professional ethics start coming out, start um, boiling over through the game. And then when we do the final review, because the whole point, okay, here's the interesting part about that game. Actually, nobody should have submitted anything <laughs> because the, the, the game was fixed in a way that uh, if you deliver, it's because you rushed the project and uh, whatever you rush through, uh, the way we frame it is such that the project will fail with catastrophic uh, results. You will actually cause lives. And then we do a debrief and then go through with the students and so on. So if students are willing to do this, uh, to cheat, we say, um, or to, to do unethical behavior for a 45, maybe two hours, I can't remember, I did the whole game, I think it's 45. Uh, what more when you have a project that actually costs real money with uh, real time, many months, years to, to get a project ongoing with real consequences. We're not talking about little prize at the end of a two hour game but we're talking about real consequences in jobs for the company's reputation, for the country's reputation, and so on. So real stakes. That game was uh, partly inspired by the NASA Challenger. If you're familiar with it, it's a classic uh, case study where the engineers and the management, uh, there was a conflict. And what happened was the, the engineer's voice was not heard properly, and uh, there was a launch for the shuttle. Uh, challenger and the challenger exploded uh, midway through flight. So actually, it's partly inspired from that. Uh, we we uh, tw tweaked it a bit to show the exact same situation that uh, participants of that game would experience. So that is uh, what I did before, and um, so I've always been interested in the professional ethics and to see um, what what we have to do to do uh, to solve ethical problems. Because engineers solve problems, isn't it? That is our pride and joy. We solve problems. And um, so what is the problem here? Well, in uh, engineering, often the problem is posed in terms of a technical. So from your first year to final year, you have your mathematical problems, physics problems, and then you have to do a circuit, you have to do an algorithm, you have to do a design to solve that problem. And uh, we have done, been doing that for a long, long time. Well, engineers, we have, uh, I mean, brought civilization to this stage because we have managed to solve problems. And some time ago, people realized that uh, we have actually introduced more problems. And that is uh, when sustainability became a problem, yes? So some time ago, not too long uh, in our civilization, we realized that we are producing a lot of pollution, we're producing a lot of waste, and that uh, we're destroying a lot of the ecosystem around us. And uh, whose fault is it? Uh, engineers? <laughs> so now engineers are now tasked uh, to solve the problem that some would argue uh, we created. But anyway, we're not here to do the blame game and engineers step up, okay? Let me just say that engineers step up and we have uh, worked towards solving those problems. We have developed uh, renewable systems, you're more efficient, uh, cost-effective, more sustainable things uh, through the whole life cycle of the product. And uh, it is part of the curriculum for every engineering uh, course in the world today, which is a sustainability uh, issue. And I think, I would like to think that uh, we take it seriously and that uh, we are uh, very mindful and we're not just all talk, we have actually worked towards those things. And that's great. But today we're not talking about sustainability, we're not talking about green, we're talking about ethics. So some time ago, not too long ago, uh, ethics also became a problem. And uh, so when it became a problem, um, we have engineers now suddenly, they have to come to the situation where it's not about circuits and algorithms, which is their bread and butter. It's not just about dealing the physical world. I mean, if you're talking about waste energy or talking about uh, renewables and so on, at least it still can be considered under engineering. But now suddenly you have people coming about ethics. But isn't that somebody else's problem? I mean, I know, I know that engineers solve problems, but surely <laughs> ethics is somebody else's problem. 
Um, but no, ethics is everybody's problem and uh, we are all part of the solution. So when engineers now come to this uh, point about where ethics into the career, into the profession, all right? So the profession, how does the solution look like? Because if we uh, say, like we say, sustainability is a problem, we can show you what's the solution. If ethics is a problem, how does the solution look like? Does it look like the like you, like me, or the ideal engineer, the ethical engineer? How does the solution look like? Well, uh, the IEEE Code of Ethics is one of those uh, so-called solutions. And uh, let me just read through it because uh, uh, I think it's important. And I think that for an IEEE talk on ethics, I really do think that we should at least have one go uh, through it. Lah. So think about think of this as like the Ten Commandments of the IEEE. <laughs> so we say, and if we were in a room, <laughs> perhaps I would invite you all to stand up, put your hand over your heart, and then read this together. Okay, uh, but that's just as a joke. Uh, but in this is a serious document. It is something that the IEEE, as Dr. Faisal just now mentioned, has taken seriously. And let me just read it. Uh, we, the members of, I, of the IEEE, in recognition of the importance of our technologies in affecting the quality of life throughout the world and in accepting a personal obligation to our profession, its members, and the communities we serve, do hereby commit ourselves to the highest ethical and professional conduct and agree. And I'll read this in brief. Huh? to accept responsibility in making engineering decisions consistent with the safety, health, and welfare of the public, and to disclose promptly factors that might endanger the public or the environment, to avoid real or perceived conflicts of interest. Number three, to be honest and realistic in stating claims or estimates. Number four, to reject bribery. Number five, to improve the understanding of technology. Number six, to maintain and improve our technical competence and to undertake technological tasks for others only if qualified by training or experience or after full disclosure of pertinent limitations. Number seven, to seek, accept, and offer honest criticism of technical work. Number eight, to treat fairly all persons regardless of such factors and so on. Number nine, to avoid injuring others. Number 10, to assist colleagues and co-workers in their professional development and to support them in following this code of ethics. Now, since we all want to be ethical, we all say, I hope, that we are ethical engineers and not just ethical engineers. We all say that we are ethical engineers in the IEEE and we all abide by the IEEE code of ethics. Uh, if I cover this up, how many of you guys can actually remember? <laughs> are these uh, things, these uh, 10 items over here, are, they, are these things that a code that we actually live by? All right, so that's something for us to think about. Now, I want to talk about the scope because there's a danger about talking about ethics. If you're not careful about the scope, you may go very, very far and beyond. When it comes to the IEEE Code of Ethics and where we are in it, um, do we want to talk about big issues like uh, China's treatment of the Uyghurs? Well, that's, that's a big thing. Because is technology involved in that? Um, do we have in terms of uh, facial recognition, uh, telecommunication te uh, technology, surveillance technology? I mean, what's going on over there? Is this something that IEEE as a professional body needs to be aware of? involved in as a member are you part of that problem it's so far away you see or i mean we also have china as a member I'm, I'm treading very lightly i understand i'm not trying to make any political statements over here i'm just trying to show the at this point in my talk i'm just trying to show that ethics is an uncomfortable topic it's not just something that we uh, joke around it's something deeply uncomfortable and sometimes very dangerous. Um, let's go to a lighter, but still a pertinent topic. Uh, talk about ethics in terms of information, fake news. So when it comes to fake news, you have fake news about treatment or COVID, uh, let's say the vaccination, the different vaccines and what they are, the risk and so on. You have fake news about that. You also have news, fake or real, about the source of 
the of the COVID pandemic. Again, very uncomfortable. You have different parts of the world, different agendas, different countries, different uh, actors uh, who are trying to uh, help people uh, make a particular decision on these questions. And does IEEE and the technology uh, involved, um, does it have a role in those things, in fake news? Because you see, algorithms, um, hardware, software, artificial intelligence, um, learning, machine learning, all these things are actually put to use in things that can affect um, the opinions of society uh, on various things, on social issues, uh, LGBTQ, on religious issues, on a political, whether the government should be elected or not. Again, I'm not making, <laughs> before anybody shuts me down over here, I am not making any political statement. You do not know my views on these things. I have not expressed my views on any of the things I said. All I'm saying is that ethics is a very uncomfortable topic. And technology plays a role in everything that I just said. But this is not a forum for those things. So thankfully, we can all now breathe a sigh of relief because I am not going to talk about those matters. I'm going to talk about things that is much closer to our heart. Things, ethical issues, not on the global scale, not in the grand civilization, societal scale, but talking about things that happens in your workplace. Okay, so going a bit lower. <laughs> and um, let's let me start with a story. Uh, there was a time uh, when I was teaching ethics to a bunch of fourth year students. Okay, and uh, the final year students, uh, engineers, lah, huh? so they've already taken some uh, ethics courses already, and uh, they have just finished their uh, industrial training. So I was just giving them another ethics uh, talk and I uh, asked them the question. Um, did you encounter any ethical issues in your workplace? And one of the students then told me that, told the class actually, that yes, um, when he was working, there was uh, his boss forged data, so made false data and asked this uh, industrial trainee to sign off. And I said, you know, it's, uh, uh, forged data. Yes, I know it's wrong because I took in the real data and then this one is it's not what the data that I took. Okay, um, so what did you do? So he said that he had an ethical dilemma. The, do, the, should he, okay, should he just do what his boss told him to do? Or should he say, stand his ground and say that, no, I will not do this because I know it's wrong. So what should he do? And, uh, what do you think he did? <laughs> so at this point, I could stop and then ask in the class or in the, in the, in the talk, all right? So what, how many people here think that he actually forged it? All right, he just signed because his boss told him to. And again, remember, he's a young industrial trainee. His boss is a senior engineer. How many of you guys think that he stood his ground and insisted that uh, he will not sign it no matter what? All right, so I could ask that question. Uh, so what he did was, He's, he told his boss that he will not be able to sign it because he's very uncomfortable doing it. Um, and if he wants to, and, and, uh, but if, he, if the boss was to sign it, then uh, that's it. That's the end of the story. So he got a third solution. Uh, so he asked his boss to sign it uh, himself or ask get someone else to sign. Okay, the essence of it is get someone else to sign. Now the question, the ethical issue remains. I told the student, but you knew the data was wrong. And you still allowed, in a sense, you didn't raise any alarm and uh, let it continue on uh, as long as you didn't sign. And therefore, you feel satisfied that you have fulfilled your ethical obligations. And the student said, yes. <laughs> but I would say that it's more towards a consequence. He knows that he will not bear any consequence if uh, things come to light. I wouldn't say and we can engage. The thing about ethics is that it is very, it's quite subjective, um, depending on culture, society, and so on, but it's not so subjective that there is no sense of right and wrong, but it is subjective in the sense that uh, the how we see the thing. 
and the student feels that he has made what is uh, ethical to the best of his ability, whereas an outsider who is not involved in the decision could think otherwise. Now, let, that, that gives me some thought and think, uh, and make me think, uh, is this situation unique to that student of mine? Only one student did that and uh, in, in my how many years of teaching. And interestingly enough, there's this paper, all right? It's a conference, uh, Proceedings of the South Asia Conference on Multidisciplinary Research 2018. And uh, it was done in Sri Lanka, all right? And uh, what we have here is engineering ethics, a matter to reconsider. And uh, in this paper, uh, they, um, they asked a survey. They did a survey, so let me just go to it. The methodology is where we, they asked 200 final year engineering students uh, of cross disciplines, civil, electrical, and mechanical, having done six months industrial training, like any good engineer, okay, you have in the industrial training. And they asked the student this question, which I highlighted over there. Briefly describe the major engineering ethical violation observed by you in your training place. And the students were uh, to respond anonymously, they're not to give their names. Uh, but they mentioned the engineering discipline. So this research paper is, uh, is the result of asking 200 final year project students about the ethical violations that they have observed. And this was the result of that paper. Uh, we have 46%, uh, let, uh, to help you explain what this is looking at, 46% uh, observed clause one of the engineering, uh, Sri Lanka engineering code of ethics being violated. Okay, so rule uh, clause one broken, 46%, clause two broken, 30%. So 76% is based on clause one and two. Clause one is engineers shall hold paramount health, safety, and welfare of the public and proper utilization of funds and other resources. So 46% broke that. And uh, engineers shall continue their professional development and shall actively assist and encourage engineers under di their direction to advance their knowledge and experience. So that is 30%. And uh, they also give some examples over here. So you see over here that the first one, in my training place there I saw, I could, saw, I could see that the spread of a cement dust to the environment. Cement dust spread heavily from that place to the nearby houses. It caused bad effects like occurrence of respiratory diseases. Senior engineers did not pay their attention uh, to mitigate this problem for a long period of time. And then we have another one. A high rank member of the company had an unethical practice of using site laborers and materials to build his own house during working time. Sometimes site work had to be stopped due to lack of laborers. Okay. Third one. Some senior engineers in my training organization did not encourage us to advance our knowledge and experience. They were always searching for mistakes of trainees. Although they had enough free time, they did not give us a time slot to discuss with them. Some engineers discriminate us based on the university. Hmm. So if I was to ask uh, again this group of uh, Region 10 engineers, um, what do you think about this uh, experiences? Is it normal? Is it something that ah, this is just normal working life, or do you consider them as ethical violations? Uh, I, a pity that we cannot have a bit more of uh, physical um, interaction. Uh. Uh, let me move on. The key word over here is ethical violations. And I thought this was interesting. I, I don't know about you, but I thought this was very interesting. And so I thought that I wanted to do a bit more research on this, because this is about Sri Lanka. And uh, maybe uh, for today's topic, uh, today's uh, talk, I can read up a bit about uh, ethical violations in various countries. Uh, Region 10 is represented by uh, 35 countries. Wow, a lot of countries, huh? 35. And so I was thinking that maybe do a bit of exploration, uh, do a bit of comparison. So let me just do uh, properly. I'll go through IEEE. So I go and search in IEEE for the keyword ethical violations. And I only got four hits. <laughs> there isn't much, and all four hits is nothing of what I was looking for, all right? So there is no survey, there is no sense of, you know, just finding out what is the issues happening in the workplace. So I thought, okay, you know what, uh, maybe I'm searching for it wrong. I need to do maybe a bit more fancier search. So I go and do all this uh, fancy uh, so search engine stuff, and then it gives me uh, 46 hits. And uh, I don't really see anything that is related to or similar to what I just saw. 
uh, what I just read about the Sri Lanka paper. So I think the Sri Lanka paper quite good, huh? Because uh, they may be doing something that uh, a bit, how do I say, controversial. Um, not something that may not be uh, easy to publish, I would say. I think it is very difficult to publish on ethical violations because, <laughs> again, I know this is being recorded, but in one sense, if you do see ethical violations, the engineer is supposed to report ethical violations, not publish them. <laughs> so let's say now that I look at this, okay? So I'm looking at, uh, from where I'm sitting, we don't have a lot of uh, papers on this. But maybe it's something that I can publish in, all right? So maybe I'm thinking that uh, I could ask you guys, all right? So you guys who are sitting here listening to this, and I'll say, all right, let me do the same thing. And then I ask you, I'll do a Google form, and I'll say that, okay, as part of this uh, talk webinar, I'll ask you to briefly describe the major engineering ethical violation observed by you in your workplace. And uh, ignore the fact that maybe you are actually one of the violators. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Um, can I do that? And soon I realized that, no, I can't. Because uh, if I was to go and grab the uh, results of this survey, impromptu survey from all of you guys, um, just, you know, just take out your phone or click or whatever it is that you're doing, and I gather the results, publish a paper, I get into trouble. Because I would actually violate my own ethical uh, requirements. Because one of the things for researchers is that we need to give you informed consent. So I need to actually, if I want to use the data that you give to me, I need to tell you what am I doing with that data. So I actually need you to sign. So I need you to actually uh, read through a participation information sheet. This is from the Curtin uh, uh, requirements. And then, uh, so I need to prepare a form. I need to get, get you to understand. And then once you understand, then you actually sign. Then once you sign, then basically giving me permission to use your data for my research. So in the process of trying to get ethical violations, I may actually be violating my own ethical uh, expectations or criteria over here. So I can't do that. Now, then we come to the question. Now, we seem, I would like to say that uh, we all, I hope, have the same sense of what is an ethical violation. I hope that we all have that same sense. Uh, I have no research to prove it, but then uh, perhaps that's something we can assume for now. Now, if we assume we all can recognize ethical violations, I, it begs the question, do we all have the same solution? Because maybe, maybe, um, when, when it comes to code of ethics, maybe the code of ethics for Sri Lanka is different from the code of ethics for Malaysia. Maybe the code of ethics for Malaysia is different from China, from US, and so on. Yeah, you see, you see the problem here? So, good news. The IEEE code of ethics that we have over here, well, uh, apparently some, uh, some people think that we can actually do a global code. So we can see here that uh, the, the main purpose of this research, uh, if you can follow where my cursor is, the main purpose of this research is to arrive at common articles, uh, meaning that clauses that can be used as a global code of ethics for electrical and electronic engineer. Wow, this guy is thinking big. So he's not content with just thinking about a uh, code of ethics for a country or even a professional body. He's talking about a global code of ethics that can apply for all countries. And how does he do that? This is an interesting research. So in this paper, he actually chose 32 engineering societies from all over the world. And uh, in this uh, paper, he said that uh, a survey found that 88% of the respondents agree that most association members adhere to the association's ethical codes. Hey, that's good news. That means that in this uh, group right now, we are confident that 88% of us are uh, following the ethical code, isn't it? <laughs> and um, that 54% of the respondents felt that their association's ethical codes need to be revised, uh, meaning that maybe we need to look into how we can improve or perhaps make it more relevant to the ethical issues that we face today. And um, it says here that uh, this paper is to consider all available engineering professional code of ethics and look at common ground to make it universally accepted. So this is what we have, okay? This is what the paper has. I'm showing you the table from that. 
And uh, number one to 10 is the IEEE Code of Ethics. Okay, can you read it? So number one to 10 over here is the Engineering Code of Ethics. And then you have the 32 countries. Okay, so maybe you can spot some of your own countries over here. Now, what is saying here is that uh, for these various countries, okay, let's take the uh, Philippines. Philippines uh, has in their Code of Ethics, in the Philippines Code of Ethics, it has all all of the IEEE code of ethics, bravo, Hong Kong and Canada as well. Okay, some countries do not have all of them because they may have different uh, things, okay, different parts. But uh, the one thing that everybody, not, not everybody has, but uh, most common, okay, the most common is code of ethics number six. And I'm sure everybody over here remembers what is number six, right? Of course not. Number six is to maintain and improve our technical competence and to undertake technological tasks for others only if qualified by training or experience. So most countries all say that number six is very important, that it needs to be in their code of ethics. Number six basically means that uh, there is no on-the-job training for uh, engineers. Uh, I mean, for specific engineering tasks. You cannot have on-the-job training for a pilot. You can't have the pilot of a plane saying that, I haven't figured things out yet, but I'll figure it out as we uh, fly. <laughs> so all code of ethics over here say, cannot. There is no such thing. Okay, you, If you're going to do engineering work, you need to be a qualified engineer. And I think that's important, don't you? So it says over here, and you can look at this table, you can find that the least, okay, the least is number, uh, only 12, and it's the number eight. Ooh, what's number eight? To treat fairly all persons regardless of such factors as race, religion, gender, disability, age, or national origin. So many countries do not have this number eight. Now, it doesn't mean that those countries, I want to just say very clearly, uh, it doesn't mean that those countries are bad, bad countries and unethical. <laughs> it just means that the people who drafted the Code of Ethics uh, did not include, at least according to this uh, research paper. Uh, because, uh, ah, someone mentioned that pilots do on-the-job training. That's very good. Uh, thank you for that. Under supervision. But I would like to say that um, my point here is to say they must reach a certain competence. I mean, again, engineers, we also follow. I mean, there is also the mentorship and we also uh, follow the senior engineer. There is, uh, I think that that's a very good process. So I agree. And in fact, in pilots, you have a senior pilot and a, and a junior pilot. So I understand that. So thank you very much. Um, but my point over here is that it is not um, coming in cola. You do have, you, you should graduate. Can I say that? And you should be qualified. I think that's more important. You should be a qualified engineer. You should be a qualified pilot. Uh, you should know uh, what is uh, expected of you and uh, have the knowledge and skills and, uh, and attributes, attitudes relevant for that. All right. So let me see. Uh, there's uh, quite a few bit of chats. So again, uh, I welcome uh, feedback. I welcome all these uh, chats around and, uh, and it helps to clarify things, okay? To make sure that I'm not saying things that you think I'm saying and then we can just move, uh, move forward with a common, how do you say, with, a, with an understanding that is uh, accurate to what I'm trying to present. So, all right. So again, I was saying that number eight doesn't mean that those countries are, are unethical. It just means that the code of ethics does not include them, but they may actually be uh, applying them. Also, I wanted to say that uh, I'm not sure how accurate uh, this uh, mapping is. So I'm not going to stake my career on the mapping because uh, I have not looked at any of those uh, 32 uh, code of ethics. So I, I will not stake my career on how well he mapped it. Okay, so those are my disclaimers over here. But again, my point over here is that it's interesting. Okay, so it's interesting that there is uh, there is um, idea of introducing a, a global code of ethics, and whether that is achievable or not is uh, one thing. There is another part which is that some of the code of ethics in those countries. Okay, so that's the reverse. Some of the code of ethics in those countries do not. It's not included in the IEEE Code of Ethics, okay? So something they have, the IEEE does not. Previously, we just looked at what IEEE has that others do not. So now we have International uh, Code of Ethics articles that are not in the IEEE. And uh, so it says that, for example, number five, uh, that's the highlighted one, the, the column there. Uh, an engineer must respect the secrecy of all confidential information obtained in the practice of his profession. So 
this author, okay, the authors over here on this paper is trying to introduce the, the how to say, a discussion. Um, so maybe some of these things over here, he, he actually uh, highlighted 10 from the various countries. Maybe some of them can actually be included in the IEEE Code of Ethics towards a global uh, Code of Ethics. So I thought that was uh, an interesting uh, look. So uh, moving past that, uh, unless there are any more questions or anything that people want to highlight, I'll go into applying the code. So we are familiar with the IEEE Code of Ethics by now, and uh, we have this uh, case study. Now here is the thing, uh, for most of us, uh, we learn about ethics through case studies. And I'm not saying it's a, it's a uh, ineffective way, by no means, I think it's very, very useful. Uh, so we have over here a case study, so we can see how we can apply. And some people uh, in this room may have forgotten, so consider this as a refresher. And uh, what we have here is, uh, again, this is drawn from uh, IEEE uh, Explore. And I'm um, just going to summarize. So you have this uh, engineer, Tim, uh, electrical engineer, who, who saw the drawings. And uh, there is this... Uh, uh, there's a mismatch, okay? They, what, he, what he expects to see and what he sees. So he goes to the supervisor and the supervisor says that you just make changes to the drawing. What you expect to see, just, just change it and then just let it go. Now, Tim says that uh, here, this uh, scenario uh, is not comfortable because uh, it, if it was built wrongly, then it could actually have uh, safety issues, okay? So everybody understand, okay? Everybody understand the case. So Tim sees something. Uh, it's not what he expects to see. He tells his supervisor. The supervisor says that just make the changes and uh, forget about it, essentially. Now, the first rule for us to apply uh, the code of ethics is to accept responsibility in making decisions consistent with safety, health, and welfare of the public, okay? So this one shows that I mean, it applies. The code of ethics applies, uh, and and the paper is a good paper. And uh, later on, maybe you can search for it and so on. It, it goes through. It walks through. How does the code of ethics apply? What are the um, the issues that he need to think needs to think about? And uh, and it's a long paper, and I wish everybody would have a read. And uh, I just summarize bits of it. Okay, I just summarize bits of it. It is important for members of a profession to understand that they are no longer merely employees of a business. As professionals, they are obligated to uphold the standards of their profession, even when that requires making their employer unhappy. They also bear responsibility for the professional decisions they make and cannot claim they were only following orders. And I think that um, the reason why I, I want to highlight this paper is because I feel, personally speaking, that for most employees, uh, this is probably the reason why uh, why employees would feel forced to um, to do things that they would not otherwise do, and that is the the pressure from trying to have gainful employment, because the pressure is real. I understand that. So when we talk about ethics, I want us to, I want you to realize that I am not. Uh, in living in fairy tale land, that uh, ethics is very uncomfortable. It's very real, and there are real consequences. And it is not easy to make these decisions. I would say. And sometimes the reason, the way we rationalize, is by just saying that we are only following orders. The thing over here is that as uh, engineers, as the profession, okay. Uh, as uh, not just because you're IEEE member, I don't think so, because you can just uh, uh, withdraw your membership and therefore think that you are no longer under the expectation of the profession. That's not true. Engineers from, uh, I think, all around the world, I would say, uh, you have to abide by these uh, principles. And uh, you cannot just say you are following orders. You have an obligation to the public. And I know that in Malaysia, that's also one of the code of ethics for the country's code of ethics. So there is a bit uh, long over here. Let me just again uh, summarize. Um, he is thinking through, all right? So there is this disagreement between the junior and the supervisor. Normally, the junior engineer finds that it's a problem. He, he, asks, he passes the buck over to the senior engineer. So therefore, it becomes no longer his problem, but the senior engineer's problem. Over here, it's not 
it cannot be done that way. Because the, the junior engineer has seen this thing and the senior engineer is asking him to lie. So even if, okay, here's the thing, even if the senior engineer is right and nothing wrong will come out of it, okay, just, just do what I say, nothing wrong, because no, I mean, it, that's the way people will talk, right? Nothing bad will happen. Just trust me. I'm more experienced than you. Uh, you're a junior. This is the way things are done, blah, 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 blah. And then the junior engineer may rationalize and say that, well, he knows what he's talking about and he will take the blame if something goes wrong. The thing over here is what I like about this is saying that even if the supervisor feels that the, that the electrical code is overly rigid and too expensive to follow, um, it, he needs to use the proper channels to change that. So meaning that it is not his decision to make. If he wants to uh, make a decision that the electrical code, the, the safety code, the health and safety, so on, is too rigid and it's not that doesn't need to comply. He, he needs to go through a legislative rather than making that decision uh, at, at his point. Okay, so your senior engineers may not be, may not make that decision. So the junior engineers need to be aware of that. All right. Um, that's reading from uh, Tom over here. Yes. Um, <laughs> that sounds very interesting. I wish that I could actually have a conversation with you. Uh, Anti-ballistic missile systems. Uh, looks very interesting and sounds like I should invite you for a talk instead. <laughs> but uh, let, let's go to this one because yours sounds a lot more better than my electrical circuit. Uh, Anti-ballistic missile systems would probably bring in a, more of a crowd. <laughs> so here's the part that uh, the last point of this article that I want to pull out. All right. So this article that uh, this paper has that. It is important to note, I'm just going to read it because I like it so much. It's important to note that the profession itself has an obligation to engineers like Tim. He is faced, he is very real, huh, with possible retribution from his employer when he tries to uphold the ethical standards of his profession. The employer can actually fire him. The profession needs to provide resources for individual engineers to protect themselves from such retribution, anonymous reporting services, ethical consultation, mediation, and lobbying for whistleblowing laws are some services that the profession may decide to provide. And why am I stressing the word profession over here? Because I am giving an IEEE talk. IEEE is, IEEE is the professional body. So people are continuing on with this thing. Uh, uh, people are capable of acting ethically even when faced with severe consequences for themselves, but it is not reasonable to expect everyone to be willing to do the right thing no matter what. Okay? It's very real. So again, some of us may be observers, some of us may be violators, some of us may uh, be very comfortable, or some of us may not be comfortable with what we have seen or done. But this is the real world. Huh? Uh, if a profession wants its members to reliably act ethically, it needs to protect them from potential fallout. This will in turn enhance public trust in the profession. And I think that uh, when it comes to why you should act ethically, I think that thinking of yourself as a professional helps in that. I think that if you think of yourself as a professional, that it is this is the way engineers behave. This is the way engineers do things. I don't know how they do things over in that side, in whatever discipline or work you are doing, but engineers don't do that. I think that actually helps. And the professional body needs to uh, help and support uh, in whatever ways possible. But that is beyond the remit of what I'm talking about over here. But I think it's important. I think that that's something that as members, you should expect from IEEE. And I'm happy to hear that that is what IEEE takes seriously as well. Uh, coming to the last part of my talk, I don't have a watch with me. Uh, 220, oh, all right. So if we are looking at another solution, Okay, let's talk about another solution. Um, because we have the IEEE Code of Ethics, but is there another way? And uh, we see here an interesting paper. I'm, I'm not saying this is to replace. La. Again, I'm just introducing interesting ideas uh, for, for this uh, seminar. Uh, there is this paper that says from ethics education to character education. Hmm, character. Oh, how about that? And it says that uh, there are two ethical theories that primarily inform discussions about engineering ethics. One is consequentialism, and, uh, which evaluates the morality of actions based on their outcomes or consequences. And the other is, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it correctly, deontology, 
which focuses on the duties and obligations we owe to others based upon certain moral principles or rules, such as the golden rule that are often universal and without exception. So we have two ways of doing things, all right? Consequence and duty. So if you're thinking about consequence, you rationalize yourself and think that, all right, uh, if, uh, if this something bad happens, what is the consequence? And if the consequence is not that bad, then maybe it's okay. And unfortunately, consequentialism is actually a very dangerous way of doing ethical thinking because you can argue yourself that if the consequence of my decision makes a one child die, uh, well, it's okay because the company still makes a lot of money and we can ask insurance to pay for that child's death because that's the consequence. You put the things into a mathematical form. And then uh, it, it's very, very, uh, how do I say, flexible. <laughs> and uh, it's, I would say, very dangerous. At the same time, we realize that we cannot spend, uh, I want to realize the reality. We cannot spend millions, millions, whatever dollars to make sure that nobody, uh, that everything is completely baby-proof. That one, I also understand. But consequentialism puts too much on on the consequences rather than on the other one, which is duty. Now, duty is very nice. And just now my appeal to you is based on your duty to your profession. And uh, that I think is, is a better one than consequentialism. But over here, this paper is actually arguing for something else. This paper over here is arguing for character. A third and less commonly used theoretical, okay, this is coming from the world of philosophy, from the ethics, is, uh, is to use uh, virtue ethics. Ah, virtue ethics. Whereas consequentialism emphasizes an action's outcome, what may happen. The problem, you know what? Sometimes we don't know whether the outcome will happen or not. We, we don't know whether the, the probability is, uh, is it accurate, the impact is it accurate. So you put too much emphasis on outcome. Deontology underscores moral duties and rules. Whereas virtue ethics, now this is the part which is good. Virtue ethics emphasizes the virtues of character that promote the flourishing of individuals and communities. Now, we don't read about that much, don't you think, about flourishing of individuals and communities. If you do, then maybe uh, you live in a better community of uh, engineers or curriculum uh, than, than I do. Uh, most of the time, we talk about the duty of an engineer, which I think is a good thing. But here it talks about character. So it sounds like a moral education, don't you think? Some, something that you can bring it in Sunday school or bring it into a religious classroom or something that you bring in the family, you know, uh, parents and children. But is it something really for hardened engineers, technical-minded engineers? Is it something that belongs there? And this paper argues yes. It says here that we have a various, uh, he has organized it and he has uh, that intellectual virtues like uh, curiosity, judgment, reasoning, moral virtues like compassion, courage, and honesty, performance virtues, uh, perseverance, resilience, uh, teamwork, and civic virtues, citizenship, civility, and justice. So, and uh, yes, a participant is saying that, I quote, a morality should be the medium to develop ethics. And it's the nice part about this paper, if I can respond to that comment, is often the ethics, how do you see, we do not see the morality coming out explicitly. Uh, things like uh, the engineer should have a responsibility. Yeah, the word responsibility, right? The, the engineer should have a responsibility to public safety. So the word responsibility is talking about duty. So what this paper does, what I find interesting about this paper, is that it makes the morality part explicit. It's saying that this is the character that we want to see in the engineers in society. I thought that was quite nice. And uh, he even used the, the NASA engineer, I think the classic uh, challenger a disaster, right? Uh, I love that, that thing because we also have a Richard Feynman, the O-ring, all that. So the, so the drama behind that is a very nice thing. So I'm familiar with it. But now he, he uses that example and he, and he uses this mapping and says that, okay, what is the displayed virtue? So he says, let me look at the courage part. So he says in courage, the displayed virtue is when the engineering team displayed courage in their efforts to raise their concerns to management and insist on delaying the launch even against NASA's strong resolve. So that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we don't do that. As far as I know, there is no, but you can correct me, I mean, participants in this can correct me, where we, we look at a case study and we say, um, how have they demonstrated courage? How have they demonstrated humility? 
How have they demonstrated wisdom? These are religious terms. These are moral terms that is not used in the curriculum. <laughs> uh, I have this moment, I'm not saying that it should or shouldn't. I'm just reporting to you guys what this paper has. And uh, personally, I think that maybe we should really consider uh, this, this direction. And uh, he makes a strong case. And one of the cases it puts, okay, one of the cases, reasons why he said we should go towards character rather than duty is that, I'll read the first uh, sentence here. Uh, oops, sorry. A third contribution of character education to engineering ethics entails an opportunity to move beyond extraordinary disaster cases and consider how the same virtues and strategies apply in everyday life. It says over here, the highlighted part, be, so it's beyond an extraordinary case. He says, this paper, okay, they say, they say that the problem is um, that if people think it is a challenger, a Fort Pinto, uh, all these like, you know, those, those case studies that you explore, and it's not the small, small things, the, the normal everyday behavior, how you relate to your boss, your supplier, your client, your colleagues, and all that, the, it's okay to cheat him as long as nobody explodes. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to tell a lie as long as, as uh, uh, nobody dies. <laughs> so he's saying that if we can highlight these things, uh, it goes not, not towards those like consequentialism, like big things, uh, duty, big things, but towards character. We can apply them into the everyday life and it's actually better for society. So I thought that was an interesting part. Um, and uh, so yes, we have some contributions from, from uh, various members uh, in the, uh, here. Yes, we're talking about communities. Uh, oh, looks like, uh, uh, yes, yes, I, I will probably go and uh, I'll finish up. I just finish up. I'm just uh, reading these things in the chat, but I'll finish up and then maybe we can have a discussion. So what we have over here, uh, just to conclude, uh, uh, is that today, today uh, I, have, I have spoken about ethics. I have said that uh, this interesting paper uh, from uh, Sri Lanka about the ethical violations that uh, um, I think is very honest. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure whether it's wise. It calls into question, I, I would say, that uh, you see, we have a problem with the Sri Lanka paper. This is my personal opinion. Uh, it doesn't represent Katin, doesn't represent Ashupa E, doesn't represent anybody. It's just my personal opinion. The problem with such a paper is this. It reveals, it's like journalism. It reveals that there is a problem. And uh, if, if the authorities, and that may be the engineering bodies and so on, or the universities or the students, whoever it is, doesn't address those problems, then those problems may continue on. So I think it's a very uh, courageous paper in that sense. The, the thing about it is that why isn't there more of this type of papers? And again, maybe it is not the right place. The IEEE is for research, technical research and so on. So maybe this type of research is not wise. I want to say here that the IEEE Explorer has lots of papers on ethics and engineering. Okay, I forgot to mention that just now. There is numerous, there are hundreds or thousands of papers on ethics and engineering. A lot of the research papers is on uh, teaching students education, engineering ethics um, in education, or the ethics in terms of application of technology, uh, bioengineering, and so on. So there are tons and tons of papers, but we don't have a lot about the realities of the workplace, perhaps because it's not under the umbrella of uh, the IEEE. I, I, don't, I think that's the reason why. Uh, but it does call the question, maybe there are loads of ethical issues because I don't think Sri Lanka is unique. <laughs> I don't think so. I think that many, many countries, whether developed or developing, also have these issues. So uh, that is why maybe, maybe there may need to be some sort of research on this. That's my, my sense. But anyway, that's just my personal opinion. Not my, not my university, it's not actually pretty and so on. Anyway, concluding, concluding. Uh, so you have engineering ethics uh, in Sri Lanka, which then led me towards a global code of ethics, which is interesting. I'm not sure whether it's possible or not, um, but well, we'll see. And uh, from there, we talk about the case studies, about how do we apply so that we can walk out of this room knowing that, okay, one way of applying it is just a, a sense of duty. And then we have the ethics character is talking about morality, about uh, character building, which is something that is uh, based on the, I mean, just uh, speed reading through the chat. 
It's something that I think participants agree, uh, but it's probably, uh, it's not explicit uh, in the code of ethics and it's not explicitly taught, at least not in my university. I, I doubt, but you can correct me, that it's actually something that's taught in, in your university. So, but I find that this is interesting. Um, the problem with such an approach is that it does seem like moralizing. And uh, the, today's society is very against moralizing, uh, that sort of uh, you are holier than thou attitude. So the duty is something that is something that people can swallow, the duty of a doctor, the duty of an engineer, the duty of a teacher. But the morals and the character is something that people may not like authority figures. Huh? We live in a very anti-authoritarian society. May not want people to be told uh, you need to be an honest or wise or well, some of the other things that we have mentioned. So I think that there is there are problems ahead, I, I believe, for the profession. But thankfully, uh, we are engineers. And engineers, what do we do? We solve problems. <laughs> and although ethics may not sound like a problem for engineers, but I hope I have convinced you otherwise for today. All right. So thank you very much. Now I would love to go and read the, the chats. And let's see whether got any interesting things. So I pass the time over to uh, uh, Dr. Savitia while I go and read through and see whether there's anything that I want to respond to. Okay. Thank you so much, Terence, for the great session today. It was really interesting to listen about the different aspects of code of ethics and how IEEE involve and how countries perform. Thanks again, uh, Terence, for all the information. Yes, we have some questions in the chat window. Um, starting with Renu. Renu has sent a few questions. Um, can you give us a general criteria to become a professional engineer? A <laughs> uh, uh, general criteria? Um... Uh, a professional engineer has 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 those criteria. I mean, we have the learning outcomes, um, and uh, the university. Uh, uh, so the you have an accreditation body. So in the accreditation body, they already say that you must have the technical knowledge. You must be able to work uh, interculturally, uh, demonstrate leadership, uh, lifelong learning. So uh, any engineer graduating, especially under the Washington Accord, uh, would actually uh, have those. Uh, attributes of uh, of uh, outcomes of what is expected of a, a professional engineer. Um, I'm not sure that I'm answering the question correctly, um, but that is uh, how I answer it. Uh, I hope I'm answering it well, and maybe other participants may want to uh, jump <laughs> in as well. I'm, I, I don't want to sound like I'm the one that knows everything. Uh. I'm far, far, far from that. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, many participants over here are far more knowledgeable than I am. But that is my answer to that question. Thank you so much, Sharon. And we have another question about um, our morals and ethics same. How can you differentiate them? Oh dear, uh, that's a question for the ethicist. Uh, those people <laughs> who actually study uh, the rule of ethics, they normally go under uh, philosophy, I believe. And uh, I suppose I, I should have uh, an answer for that. Um, um, I'll be honest, I was supposed to go and read up on that because I think that's a very uh, expected answer. But I, if I, uh, in my rush, I have not read up on that. My, my sense of it is that um, Ethics tends to be colder and the morals tends to be warmer. Let me explain. Ethics seems to be something that you can dissect, that you can actually get a bunch of engineers, technically minded, or physicists or mathematicians and so on. And then you can go around and talk about ethics. Um, it's something that, uh, for example, it's much easier to talk about a code of ethics uh, for a profession rather than a code of morals for a profession. Morals is warmer, and uh, I mean woman in the sense also that's fuzzy. I'm not sure that I'm helping. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm confusing you rather than this is Terence Stan's version of uh, the definition rather than any any uh, organizations, <laughs> Oxford or whatever. Um, but I think morals is very loose. For example, drinking alcohol is uh, is it a moral uh, problem in uh, in the US a long time ago uh, during the prohibition era, it is a moral issue. 
Uh, so you have uh, policies, you have uh, uh, rules and, uh, and the climate. Uh, so it, you have that sort of... Uh, so morals seems to be a bit more flexible. Uh, Daniel O'Brien says that ethics is a system, morality is a trait. Mm. So that is uh, another definition. Thanks right, a lot, so, Terence. Yes, yep, yes, sure. sounds sounds interesting. And we have uh, Prof. Lance has raised hand. Um, Prof. Lance, would you like to share anything? Prof. Lance. All right. Uh, while we wait for Prof. Lance, I have one more question to Terence. Um, is following ethics lead to any uncertainties? Can you repeat the question? Is following ethics leading to any uncertainties? Uh, yes, that's right. Um, life is uncertainty. I'm sorry if I'm so philosophical, <laughs> but life itself is an uncertainty, right? I mean, you don't live in a deterministic uh, life. I mean, there are so many things. We don't know what will happen at the end of this. Uh, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen in the next second. Let me try to, I mean, if, if, the, if the questioner can give a bit more uh, uh, substance, flesh, flesh out the question a bit more. Uh, if I'm going to guess, it's saying that uh, the, the fear of uncertainty uh, that things may go bad. Because if we talk about uncertainty, we talk about risk. Risk is normally bad. We don't talk about risk in terms of good things. And yes, if you are asking that question, does following ethics carry risk? The answer is most definitely yes. Uh, that's why I'm very sympathetic uh, when people tell me that uh, um, they have an ethical dilemma. So they have... Uh, I mean, I have seen... I have friends, and I'm, I'm sure that most of you guys have this type of situation where uh, your a friend or yourself are in a very... I just tell you to you, lah. Even though this is recorded, someone that I know was asked to pass the bribe, and uh, my friend is a very moral person, so he he goes to church, and uh, he he's he's not saying anything. Please don't misunderstand me. Not saying that Christians are morally upright, and there are historically Christians who are not morally upright. But anyway, he is a devout guy, and then he is uh, he considers himself as a moral person, and he doesn't want to give the bribe, but it is so. You see, he now is in an ethical dilemma. It's not him giving the bribe. He is just a postman. But he doesn't want to. But his boss insists that he does it. So he does it. But he is now in that dilemma because he finds that he's been compromised. His uh, position has been compromised and he doesn't like it. And, uh, but he needed the job. So it's very easy to moralize in, in this sense, but no, you should not have done it. You should stick it up to your boss. You should have done this. You should have done that. I think it's very easy for anybody to say so. And, and maybe that is the correct way of doing things. Uh, I'm not sure. But I find it, I find it, I sympathize, all right? I, I sympathize with the situation. And the good news for him is that he switched jobs. He got a better job with a better pay. And uh, in a more in a company that doesn't require him to do any of this type of nonsense, so the story ends well. But at that point in his career, it was something that really troubled him. And I think I will put it to you this way: then, I think that you should be troubled. I think engineers should be troubled. Mm -hmm. I think the code of ethics uh, should uh, should come into your conscience. Um, and I think that uh, we, you should try to resolve the ethics, not by compromising yourself, but trying to do what is right. I may be, I am an idealist. Now. You, none of you guys know me very well, but I think that uh, uh, I am an idealist. I, I think that uh, people should uh, be ethical. And that's how I teach my students. Thanks, thanks, Terence. Yeah, I, I was your student as soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I remember. <laughs> of course, I remember. <laughs> uh, All right, we have Prof. Lance here with us. Prashant, can you add Prof. Lance to the panelist, um, please? He cannot unmute. Hi, Prof. Lance. Sorry for the technical issue. Hello, good afternoon. Greetings, all. Well, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Terence Tan, uh, for on this topic. I perfectly agree with you that this is a very important topic. As a matter of fact, I just gave a talk yesterday 
um, to uh, one of the student branch. And actually, I look at the acronyms IEEE, and one of the things that I have uh, rephrased it to integrity, uh, looking into in terms of the ethics, you know, the engagement, and also empathy. I highlight about those four points. Well, anyway, well, coming back to the um, to your talk, um, I, I, I agree with you that well, with some of the papers I mentioned, but I just want to well update well if our members and participants in here. As a matter of fact, IEEE well have been doing quite a fair bit of work even as recently as last year. And as a matter of fact, well, for the code of conduct where well, you have shown earlier on, and I looked at the day it was on the August well 1990. And as a matter of fact, if you take a look at IEEE, our latest version is in the June 2020, and that's been updated. So I just want to use this opportunity to let well the participant know that some of the well um, information and resources within IEEE that you should take a look for yourself. And I do believe that well, all of us as members of IEEE well should be updated and then look at uh, upholding our utmost high standard. So first of all, as I have mentioned, it's on the IEEE Code of Conduct. The latest one is on the June 2020. And then the second one is, well, we do have this, uh, what they call the Ethics and Members Conduct well, Committee, so EMCC. And then we also have also well, rolled out, well, since April this year, we have a standardized across the whole IEEE spectrum, a hotline well, whereby well, people can uh, submit, well, um, in terms of any uh, issue where well, they observe. Although uh, I'm not going through all the details in terms of the of the 10 codes of conduct, where well, you use the terms of 10 commandment. And I would say that, well, it's really quite ideal, as you mentioned, but it's really quite hard to, to check. Because you must bear in mind that IGW, no doubt, is a professional organization. But really, we do not have any powers, well, over well, the members, and especially for the local, well, uh, legislation, where well, we do not have uh, over power overriding them. So you mentioned yeah. about the ideal cases, well, diversity and inclusion, well, yeah. equality. But then again, we know that some countries, well, maybe they do consider gender as an issue. So those are the things that we have to be very careful. And also another very interesting, well, uh, resource I would like uh, you to take a look is in terms of the um, IEEE uh, Global Ethics um, for the Intelligence System. Okay, so as a matter of fact, well, they, they do a publication and they do an ethical aligned design, the version one and version two. And in there, you provide a very good background. Well, in terms of the um, of the um, ethical design, and also they have well uh, looking into the historical and culture well issue as well. So those are another one I would strongly encourage where people take a look if you're interested in this one. Again, last year I have given a talk. Well, I have invited so some people from the um, um, from the standard association, uh, standard standard well board for well, IEEE. Because one of the things that IEEE will be looking at in terms of certification of those well intelligent system, are they able to meet the ethical requirement as well? Well, another one very well useful, and I, again, well, I would encourage the people to take a look is the IEEE Ethics History Repository, I E H R. So really, it covers all the ways back from 1880, well, until the mid 1990s. Well, what IEEE have been looking into these issues of ethics. So I do really, really do not want well, members having the impression, thinking that we do nothing about the ethics. Okay, far from it. Now let's put it this way: I have been in education well for 36 years. I have seen enough work been students been doing. So you're talking about ethics. You're talking about co copying. You're talking about well, cheating in examination. You tell me, I, I I can tell you plenty. And not only that, I'm currently involved with the uh, IEEE uh, Conference Quality Committee, with the Technical Program Integrity Committee as well. We do have well the power to whereby we reject the proceeding going into well into uh, into explore. We're also talking about that uh, we have papers being well retracted because of we see issues in that. So even I'm not talking about all the other aspects of ethics, but really just on the publication itself, well, we do see there's a lot of issue. You take a look at a lot of um, actual papers, well, you, really, it's nothing new, really. So on that basis, I first of all, well, I, I thank you and 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 I really encourage well, uh, Dr. Terence Tan to continue the working well in this area, and also well, you, you mentioned that let it publish in this area, and also we need to work together well to promote well the ideas well, and also the, the necessity requirements for ethical well behaviors and conduct well for the IEEE members. Okay, again, once again, thank you so much. Just a comment. Thank you. I just want to respond. I'm so sorry if I'm using the uh, out of date one. Uh, I didn't do a Google search and that was the one that came up. So I didn't realize that there was a new one. Um, so any mistakes is actually on, on my part. But thank you, uh, Professor uh, Lance or Dr. Lance, uh, for uh, your comments. I, I received them uh, warmly. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks a lot.
just before I go, okay, that's one more portal I forgot to mention as well. It's called the IEEE Tech Ethics, T E C H T H I C S. They also have a regular, well, a webinar video. See, for example, the reason one they have uh, in March, well, 2021, uh, they talk about new te technology, ethics, and policy engagement for sustainable development, the global environmental solution. So there are resources, but there are also a lot of other past well, videos as well. Again, I strongly encourage. So it's another one like the health and um, human well-being, ethical, le well, legal, and policy consideration, well, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I, I encourage everyone to look into this topic. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Prof Lance, for those informative, informative details. Um, we, we have one question in the Q&A chat. Um, do you feel all the organization enterprises companies should have the code of ethics towards their employees? Uh, on employees, uh, I think, again, we do have some companies who do have some sort of manifesto. If you remember Google, it had <laughs> a long time ago when it started, it said, do no evil. <laughs> so those were in the early days. Lah, and uh, at the moment in time, uh, it's a question whether uh, do they still do no evil or not um, in, in all the things that they do. Again, I'm not making uh, any, I'm not expressing my own personal opinion or whether it is or it's not. But um, that is an example of a company who did start off with uh, those intentions. Um, I think that uh, there is this thing about, uh, there was a time, I'm not sure whether it still continues on, where companies talk about values. So you talk about the values of the company, integrity, and so on. Curtin University has its own uh, set of values, uh, five of them. And uh, uh, the idea behind them is that everything that we do abides by, by those things. The problem for even with the, the how do I say, with the kindness of intentions, okay, with the sincerest of intentions, sometimes this is a code of ethics or values and so on, uh, does become lip service. People just say, and people can parrot it out, but they don't actually do. And I'm not saying this applies to all companies, because I think it's very unfair. But I'm saying that for some companies, it does become like that. So uh, it really is, I'm, I finished looking through some of the comments. I believe it is a community thing. I think that uh, it is part of the community. Uh, Professor Lance has explained about the community of professionals and the efforts that IEEE has done. And I, I comment um, on, on those things. And I believe that any employee in any company should be in, in there. And uh, yes, like uh, Daniel is saying, that a company has values, a company has private interests, people have personal interests, or oh, everybody can read that. So um, yes, so I think that if, um, if the com com communities that you belong in, be it the social or NGOs or uh, uh, religious or uh, any, I mean, even just uh, interest groups, uh, they have certain values. And those values, I think, can carry on into the workplace. I mean, of course, we would like to have the workplace to have values, but sometimes we are not in the position, you see, that, that's the problem. We may not be in the position to, to impose or to influence. Um, but I think the professional body side is very good. I think that uh, that's the whole point of today's uh, session and what Professor Lance was saying. You are actually in a professional body which has a very strong sense of uh, ethical uh, expectations. It says there that we are, if I'm not mistaken from memory, we in the IEEE. So as long as you are in the IEEE, you actually automatically abide by those uh, code of ethics already, in addition to the code of ethics that you do as an engineer in your country. So I think in a way it's sufficient. The problem is not, sorry for being draggy, the problem is not whether we have one or not, it's whether we comply or not. <laughs> I think that's more of the problem. So any violations occur, it's not because those things are not written out. Those things are already written out. It's people are jumping the red light. They know that it's a red light, but they're still jumping it. <laughs> that is the problem. And the problem of jumping red light is that sometimes you get away with it, and sometimes you cause a crash and kill someone. Thanks a lot, Terrence. And that comes to the end of our Q&A session. Um, I would like to now move on to our official vote of thanks and closing remarks. Um, Prashant, can you share the slides, please? So for the word of thanks and closing remarks, I would like to invite Mr. Sanjay Chowdhury, the Region 10 Industry Relations Chair, 
Mr. Sanjay is also the immediate past chair of IEEE Kolkata section and also the India Council vice chair. So, uh, Mr. Sanjay, over to you. Thank you, Savitya. Thank you very much. Uh, I would rather thank Dr. Terence Tan for a wonderful experience sharing session, which has struck a chord in my heart. To me, I'm a firm believer in following the ethics and today your speech and your experience sharing has even formed up and even hardened it. What I could make out from the session that you have shared that whatever is unethical is unethical, whatever may be the situation. Come what may, you have to follow the ethics that the situation demands. Whether you are with your family, whether we are with your children, whether you are with your friends, or maybe office colleague. Yep. At your workplace, we have seen that you may get a retribution from the seniors for not following their dictum, but I always assure them that do not get carved down. Follow the ethics, what is expected of you, and what the situation demands. That is your obligation. Following the ethics and how diligently you follow is a reflection of your moral character. Thank you very much, Terence Stan, for sharing and upholding the values which are very close to our hearts. Whatever you have said, if the participants who have just started their career stepped out of their protective world from the universities and colleges and into an unprotective environment, that is very, very important. They should take a heart from your speech. As a token of our appreciation, we have a small memento we would share with you, but you know that this is a pandemic time. So although we wish to meet face to face, but we have designed the e-memento for you, which I would request that you accept on behalf of the 10 top team. Thank you very much. Terence for the wonderful experience sharing session. Thank you very much. I and should also I thank Dr. Savitya Sivakumar. Yes, I will, thank Sivan Kumar. Yes. I will also thank Dr. Savitya Sivakumar for organizing this special event and bringing on board Terence for this experience sharing. Thank you very much, Savitya. The team that had been working behind the scene for making this 10 talk series a success, day in and day out, Prashant, Akila, Ashwant, Hisham, Renu, and Kanita. Thank you very much. Thank you very much from the core of my heart. I can say that you have done a wonderful job in organizing this 10 talk and behind the scene prior to the event and after the event. You are working tirelessly to make it a success. Thank you, Mathurji, for inspiring the entire Tent Up team because we are following whatever you have envisioned in for the Region 10. Thank you, Dr. Zia, because you have been an inspiration right from day one. You have conceptualized, designed, and implemented, and now you are handholding the entire Tent Talk process and trying to institutionalize it and we can assure you that it will be there. Thank you, Professor Onoy, Professor Prakash Lohana, Savitya, Emiliano, and Professor Jennifer Ducruz. Thank you very much for all the committees, the Relation, Industry Relations Committee, the Professional Activities Committee, the YP Committee Young Professionals, and the Student Activities and the we women in engineering. Thank you very much for your collaboration and making the ten ten talk a real success story. Thank you very much. Over to Savitya. Thanks a lot, Mr. Sanjay, for your kind words. Um, to all our attendees, kindly send us your feedback. We are eagerly, eagerly waiting to know uh, your feedback to improve our upcoming events. Um, next slide. Please do connect with us uh, um, 
in our Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube to know our all our upcoming activities and uh, coming to our next webinar uh, on the 24th of uh, July uh, from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time. We are having a webinar on game theory introduction and its possible application by Professor Sardar, Victoria University, Australia. So please stay tuned with our social media and mailing list. We'll be sending the registrations to soon to all of you. Once again, I would like to thank all our participants for actively joining us today and looking forward to meet you all in a similar event coming up soon. So have a great day, have a good weekend and thank you all. Take care. Bye bye. To all our uh, panelists, kindly wait for a short group photo. Um, Prashant, uh, can you take the photo? Unfortunately, I cannot on my camera. Okay. I do. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you. I request on the panelists to turn the video for the On a count of three. Again, one more. One, two, three. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. All thanks a lot, Terence, Dr. Faisal, thanks and a lot. Sanjay, and all our committees. Thanks a lot. Sai, can you share the feedback form on the screen for our attendees? Sure. sure. I'm doing Thank you. All right, so uh, my personal uh, thank you to the organizing uh, committee. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, if there's any feedback that uh, re relevant to me, you can uh, let us, uh, let us, uh, Servita, to pass it on to me. So... Sure, Terence. Thanks a lot, Terence, for your time and all the informative sessions. It's very interesting. And I'll just share with you all the feedbacks as well. All right, then. Okay, then. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. 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 Hi, Prashant. I think we can end the session now. Sure, I'll do it.